It's always a little dangerous to get thanked before I preach. <laughs> but it is really uh, wonderful to be with you here, Dina, June, the uh, ministers of this congregation, the uh, choir, the musicians, the uh, coordinators of worship, the people who serve coffee, the people who work at uh, Pride, and every one of you. It is really my honor to be with you today uh, to celebrate this 51st anniversary of this congregation, 51 years of worship and witness with the 2S LGBTQI community, with our allies, with our friends, and even with some of our enemies who are all our neighbors. You are looking very good for 51. <laughs> In fact, uh, if truth be told, as we age, maybe the best compliment we get or I get is, at a certain age, you look good for your age. And I am just a little bit older than 51. I've got the body of a 30-year-old. You can laugh, or you can say amen. But, you know, as we get older, uh, it gives us time to reflect, to think, to look at the past, the present, and the future. But as I thought about today, I was thinking about when I turned 50. And I had a habit in those days of meeting well, probably my best friend at the time uh, for a drink or something every Thursday night. And we chose to meet uh, at Woody's. It was an easy place to meet because if we were meeting in a cafe or a restaurant and one of us was late, I was clergy, he was a journalist. Uh, you look a little odd sitting there by yourself, maybe for an hour waiting for someone. At Woody's, you can stand up, walk around, and take a little tour of the place. This particular Thursday night, just before I turned 50, I made a little tour. And for some of the older gentlemen in the crowd, you might remember that there was a bar at the back of Woody's and you could walk around the bar. So I made a little tour and this uh, 20-something gave me a stare. I, I, I kind of perked up, straightened my shoulders. I thought, mm, I still got it. I walked a second tour. He stared again. I got a lot of confidence at that point. I took a few minutes, I made a third tour, and he stopped me and he said, I'm sorry for staring, but it's just that you look so much like my grandfather. <laughs> it, it was like a dagger through my heart. <laughs> and I got home that night, a little bit later, and I said to my partner and a husband, Marco, I said, we need a holiday. <laughs> we went to Greece, I sat on the beach and I reflected, on being 50. Well, you look good for 51. In my 40 years as an ordained minister in the United Church, and I had my 40th anniversary this year, I have followed your work, yes. And I do consider, I do consider my work in Parliament to be an extension of my ministry, not something different. It is part of the calling we all have to, to work uh, publicly, to work privately, and to try to make our world just a little bit better than we found it. But in those 40 years, I have followed the work and witness, and I have seen this congregation grow steadily. It grows in faithfulness. It grows in ministry to its members, to this city and province and country, and in ministry to the world helping bring people here to this country, extending out the love that MCC Toronto has learned here and doesn't stop here. Charity and this congregation maybe begins at home, but it doesn't end here. And I want to thank you for that witness, which has been something which has motivated me in ministry and life over these last 40 years. We talk about you regularly, and I just want to acknowledge my colleague and friend, uh, Julie DeBrusen, who is here. She speaks about you regularly, too, as the MP for this area. And it's a bit, it's important to us to see beacons of hope that keep shining. Being good for your age is not only a compliment, but it's also a statement of fact and an acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement that we aren't spring chickens not spring chickens as a congregation or many of us as individuals. But being of a certain age and being a mature congregation means you can take an anniversary to look back 
on the past. You can look back on the past of our denominations, of our tradition as Christians, and reflect on some of the horrors and disappointments that the Christian church has wrought upon the world. We can look back on that past and say, it is part of our past and still needs reconciliation and healing. It's like us, like the reason we say a prayer of reconciliation week after week, to acknowledge that we are not perfect, our churches are not perfect, our world is not perfect, and we continue to work on it. It also means that we can live in the present. And we can look around at each other and see those of differing gender identity, sexual orientation, preference, and radically embrace people who may be different, who may be different from the majority of people in our society. It means accepting, even as we walk in here, day after day, week after week, we come to a place of healing. We come to a place of restoration. As a gay man, I know what it is like to not just be able to be average. Every one of us knows we have to be a little better than average just to be seen as average. But we come to this place and declare our averageness. We declare that we are just human beings, created in the image of God, failing some days, succeeding other days, and living fully as God would have us live. That's what being in the present means, acknowledging who we are and striving every day for healing and love and reconciliation. But a, an anniversary is also an opportunity to look to the future and to look boldly into the future. It is a way to look at what is going on in our world today and imagine a different world, to take on what it is that needs fixing in our world the prejudice and the hatred, the anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, sexism and heterosexism, transphobia, looking at our world and imagining a different world where we're able to co-create with anybody in this world for a better tomorrow. So at an anniversary, we look ahead and we name even the isms we don't know yet because in every generation, we recognize that we've not been perfect, and so we're in constant change. It's an honor be, to be with you today to celebrate this day, and at this midpoint, I want to tell you, relax. They tell me that a yellow card goes up at 14 minutes, a red card goes up at 15 minutes. I'm colorblind. <laughs> and if you only get invited to preach every 51 years here, and I've hinted before, you settle in, because I've got a few things I want to share with you as someone who loves this congregation deeply. This is a place where you know what it means to be of the past, of the present, and of the future. This is a place where a former United Church used to be. And I can't tell you how happy I am that MCC Toronto bought the building from Simpson Avenue United Church. It was a dying congregation, moribund. It had lost its purpose in this neighborhood, and you took this building and continued to reinvigorate it. I love the renovations, just keep doing it. Nothing can ever stay the same. I grew up in the United Church, and I grew up in that era, it was called the New Curriculum. And in the Sunday school rooms, and they would have been here too, there were posters out that said, live love and God is love. And I'm proud to be part of a denomination that was, in its day and probably still, the most liberal mainline denomination in the country. I made lifelong friends in my home congregation in Sault Ste. Marie. I was part of the Sunday school, part of the youth group, the choir, I played the piano, I played the organ, sang in senior choir, I directed the junior choir. It was my second home. And it was my family's second home. Funerals, weddings, baptisms, our whole family was there week after week after week. But through all those years of growing up in that church, I knew that I was different. From up at the age of 11 or 12, 
I knew that I liked boys the way my friends liked girls. No one knew. And despite the strong belief that God is love, despite the posters that declared live love, despite the messages that came from the pulpit about acceptance and tolerance and social justice, I never felt able, willing, or courageous enough to tell anybody who I was. I went back to the Sioux after university here in Toronto. I led the youth group. I led the confirmation class. And I began to think about ordained ministry. I was an accountant. I was way too sexy to be an accountant. <laughs> so I decided to be clergy instead. That's where the sexy people go. <laughs> but I was afraid to acknowledge it. And I needed to talk to someone because I knew part of my life was here, and that was as a gay man trying to find a way in the world, and as a person of faith trying to make a difference in the church. And I couldn't reconcile the two. And so I asked to meet with our minister of education, our Christian education minister. Her name was Eileen Haddon. She was serious. She had been in that congregation since I was an infant. She had led the Sunday school, which was over a thousand kids in Sunday school in that day. And she was strong and smart and wise. And I felt my pastor. She wasn't the senior pastor, but she was my pastor. And I wanted to talk to her about what it meant to be going into ministry. I hinted broadly but didn't come out. I wasn't sure that I could even say that to her. But she picked up on the hints, and she suggested I talk to another pastor, a minister in another United Church. And with him, being a bit of a stranger, I told him the whole story. I told him about my first crush, my first love. I told him about my fear of coming out and could I be clergy in the church in the 20th century? Would it be possible? And he opened up his arms, he embraced me, and he held me, and he accepted me, and he told me that he had always seen me and felt that I had a calling in the church and I needed to do it. He cried with me and changed my life that day, but he made one mistake. He said he felt a little out of his realm to talk to me. So he suggested I go to this psychologist that he knew. And he said, I thought he could probably help me with the transition. What he didn't know was he was sending to me who would attempt to do conversion therapy on me. I didn't know at the time that that's what it was. I didn't know at the time that he was trying to make me normal. I didn't know what he was doing as he began to manipulate my mind and my spirit and even my body. I didn't know what that meant, but somehow instinctively I knew it was wrong. I felt like I was a left-handed person they were trying to make with my right, write with my right hand. I could probably write with my right hand, but no one would be able to read it. No one would be able to understand it. It wouldn't be who I was. And something deep down, and I think it was because of the core of being that I had from the United Church of Canada about God being love, I knew it was wrong. And I got out before too much damage was done. I went back to Eileen, and I told her the whole story. And she gave me a bear hug, like you wouldn't believe. She apologized for me being sent to the wrong place. I said, no, we're right place, wrong time, wrong person. And I needed to hear from her that she would be with me. And she was, and was with me till the day she died. Sent me off to Vancouver School of Theology where I was ordained eventually. I came out to my ordination committee before it was legal in the United Church. They didn't know what to do with me. I told them I was gay. And they said, well, we're going to ordain you anyways, because we don't know what to do about that. 
And then we began the long debate, and I see Brent Hawks in the group today. He knows what went through in the 1980s in the United Church of Canada. He stood with us. He helped us. He engaged with us. I worked on that gay ordination in 1988. Finally, LGBTQ people were able to be openly ordained in the United Church of Canada. It's a big deal. 1990. And with the prodding of MCC, the United Church started doing same-sex covenanting services in 1990. And together with MCC, we worked on equal marriage rights till the time in 2005 where we were finally able to stand up and declare our love, not only privately but publicly, and have it acknowledged by the state, by our country. The next year, my mother looked at me and said, well, when are you and Marco getting married? Mm -hmm. I always fought for the right not to get married as well as the right to get married. And she said, well, do you know how many weddings I've been to? How many wedding presents I've given? It's time to get some of that back. <laughs> so with his mother pushing us, who had terminal cancer at the time, my mother pushing us, my father pushing us, we got married. Parental pressure. It was a shotgun wedding. <laughs> 32 years later, we're still together. And it's because of the witness of places like MCC Toronto that we've been able to have the life that we've had. I'm not overstating it when I say you're a light to the world. I'm not overstating it when I say when taking Jesus' words out of that gospel reading today, Jesus calls us to be a light unto the world. And he says it would be silly to put that under a bushel basket. God gives us that light and makes us shine so the whole world would see it. And you're doing it, but I want more from you. I want that light to burn even more brightly tomorrow than it does today or did yesterday. It needs to shine for this whole city. It needs to shine at pride, but pride is 365 days a year. It needs to shine in this country. It needs to shine around the world where LGBTQ people are still threatened and killed day after day. It needs to shine to bring asylum seekers and refugees to this country to make them feel welcome because, of course, their lives are better, but Canada is better when they're in this country. We are better when we're in this place together. I want, I want you to make that light shine a little bit better, and some days I'm sure it feels like a heavy burden on you. I'm sure it feels like a lot is being asked of a relatively small congregation. But God doesn't give us things we can't handle, and everyone is gifted to do that work. We don't do this alone. We do that because we have a God who gives us the power and the gifts and the courage to do it. Look around. Don't look at me, look at each other for a minute. And see in the eyes and the lights and the faces of the people around you the gifts that God has given each one of you to be that light to the world. We do it also because Jesus has illuminated our path. There are many lights in the world. There are many roads to the top of a mountain. There are many people that we follow. Some will follow the teachings of Buddha, of Confucius, of, of Moses, of, of the great teachers and wisdom leaders, the secular leaders of our world as well. We've chosen to follow Jesus. It's a choice. And he's illuminated a path for us so that we can shine for others. And we do it because the Spirit of God holds us and is present with us. She never lets us go. She holds us and is absolutely tireless in making sure that we have firm ground under our feet, people around us to hold us, and a benevolent God that will inspire us. Now, I should end there. I'm not. <laughs> but I want to tie in that first reading as well probably wondering, what's that about, that Exodus reading today? Well, the rabbis say there are many truths in every reading, but for me, that reading is also about our future. It's not enough just to be 
a light unto the world. But that story of Israel, of the, the Hebrew people leaving slavery and moving to promised land, moving to freedom, is a story that each one of us has in our own hearts. It's not a direct way. It's not a smooth path. It's a roundabout way. If I get the reader, that was so well read, thank you. You told us about the roundabout way that God has with our lives. There's no straight lines. There are curvy lines, gay lines, lesbian lines, trans lines. They're never straight. We keep following that way. And just like the people of Israel, we're guided. And read that story again. Go home this afternoon and read it again because it's really important. By night, the people are led by a pillar of fire. Everywhere, constantly, so they could move 24 hours a day. By day, they're led by a pillar of cloud, shielding, shading, hoping, protecting. And think about that. That's God. That's the image that the Jewish people had of God. God comes to us in the other. When all is dark, God comes to us in light. When all is light, God comes to us in shadow. Look around again. This, look around, come on, don't look at me. This is a congregation of diversity. God comes to us in the other. When all is white, God sends black people, people of color to this congregation. When all is dark, God sends white people to this congregation. We're a diverse city. We're a diverse country, and we're better because we're diverse. We don't put up with it. We don't tolerate it. We celebrate it. We celebrate it in this place, in this city, in this province, in this country, and we can't let that go. We have to hold on to that. We hold on to that because that's the way God gets to know us. God gets to know us in our diversity and when we celebrate it. We become pulled closer to God. God never lets us go. God is always pulling. If I'd had a psalm today, it would have been the 23rd Psalm. And in that lovely passage, it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Well, in the Hebrew, it's not following passively. It's chasing and pursuing. It's hounding. It's pulling us. And God does that by creating differences. God loves differences. God can't stand lukewarm, it says in Revelation. God can't stand sameness. God wants difference and diversity. And God is patient about that. Closing story. I'm almost done. True story. Many years ago when I was at seminary in Vancouver, uh, I did a summer internship. I went off to Geneva, and one of my other friends uh, went to Ireland to work with a thing called Young Christians for Global Justice, part of the World Council of Churches. And while I was in Geneva at the WCC, he was in a little village in Ireland, and he was getting a little bored, and one day he was asked if he could uh, do an errand for the leaders, and it was to go and pick up a package at the postal station in the village. He said, sure, and they gave him a set of keys, and he took the keys, and he got into the car. He looked at it. It was a standard transmission. He had never driven a standard before. He had seen it done. He knew the theory. He thought he could get it to work. Took a minute. He got the clutch in. He got it started, and he continued, and he thought, huh, I can do that. He kept going until he got towards the village and was at the top of a hill. At the top of the hill was a street light. He saw it green and he just kept praying he's going to make it. It turned yellow, it turned red. He had to stop. Nervously, he was holding the clutch in and trying to make sure that he could get the car going. The light turned green. He got it going, he jerked it ahead, stalled it, rolled back. The light turned yellow, red, turned green again. He kept going, he stalled it, rolled back. Four times, five times. Finally, guy from the car behind him, there's a lineup behind him, got out of the car, 
he rolled down his window and he said, is there any particular shade of green you might be waiting for? <laughs> MCC Toronto, the light's not red, the, night's, the light's not yellow, it's green. The light is green for you to take the next 51 years of ministry and mission and witness and faithfulness, of discovery and adventure. The light is green. We are expecting the best. God knows you've got the best. We will be in this together. Thank you. Amen.